Good morning, everyone. Who can claim that you are not in a liberal arts and science faculty, please? <laughs> it is my privilege to present to you Dean Patrick McGreevy. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to say what I would have liked to say about Patrick McGreevy because of the so many tasks we had to do yesterday. But you all know that Dean Patrick McGreevy is the 11th Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. He is a geographer by training. He uh, served in uh, the US in, at Boston and the uh, Clarion Universities, and he produced two major publications uh, on the Niagara Falls and the Erie Lake. He has been with us at AUB since 2004, where he came for the first time as the director of the Al-Walid bin Talal Center for American Studies and Research, and he served in this capacity until 2009. After 2009, he was appointed dean of the faculty, which he has served with all diligence and greatness of heart, I would say. Uh, Dean Patrick McGreevy has made this event happen. He has encouraged us, he has always supported our ideas and our claims, and I would like myself now in turn to thank him very much for this. Please, Dean McGreevy. <clears throat> Writing in 1941, when AUB and FAS were celebrating their 75th anniversaries, Stephen Penrose observed that the university's anniversaries seemed to fall during times of extensive turmoil, 1919, 1941, and the year 2016 uh, seems to continue that pattern. Particularly in such times of uncertainty, it's appropriate for us to be reflective, to look back at how we arrived here, and to try to look forward. Though it is not easy amidst us such turmoil to see the way ahead. In the beginning, the entity we now call the Faculty of Arts and Sciences had a different name. It was called Syrian Protestant College. The institutional history of AUB is a story of adding new faculties or cleaving off parts of FAS, most recently the Olean School of Business, while leaving FAS still positioned at the heart of AUB. The remarkable persistence of this faculty and this university was only possible because of the willingness to change, to change in response to the various challenges faced. Looking ahead now, there's one thing we can be certain of, and it is that we're going to face more challenges that will require us to keep changing. So as we prepare for the inevitable transformations ahead, the key question for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, in my view, is what is it that must remain? What is at the heart of FAS and AUB that must be preserved and enhanced? This is the uh, main question I want to address this morning. I will home in on this question from a number of angles. The first of these is the question of what we ultimately want our students to gain from their time with us. In a recent article, Jeff Noonan questioned the value of learning outcomes assessment because, he says, it confuses the means of education with the ends. Learning outcomes, he writes, presuppose and reinforce a consumeristic attitude toward education. They present the purpose of pursuing a course of study as the purchase of a defined set of skills and a circumscribed body of information, which can then be used as a marketing pitch to future employers. But teaching, he argues, is not a practice of communicating or transferring information but of awakening in students the desire to think by revealing to them the questionability of things. Of course, teaching always involves skills and always involves information. But for Noonan, these are the means rather than the actual end of education. Successful teaching, he writes, results in students who love to think and never stop thinking 
for the rest of their lives. The second angle I want to explore begins with the question, what is at the heart of research? Researchers inhabit the border between the known and the unknown. They attempt to venture beyond what is currently known and try to integrate what they discover into existing knowledge. In this sense, research exists on the cutting edge. But as Samuel Weber has pointed out, to cut, that edge must cut in more than one direction, not merely into the unknown, but into established knowledge itself. Like Noonan's idea of the ends of teaching, research requires an attitude that things are questionable. Viewed from this basic and perhaps idealistic perspective, both teaching and research involve an engagement with others, a conversation in which neither truth nor authority are fixed. My third angle to approach this question of what is at the heart of FAS and must be preserved and enhanced is to consider disciplinary traditions. In FAS, we have 27 different disciplines. It is clear that academic disciplines as we know them first appeared in Germany in the late 18th century. One theory is that they were a response to information overload, specifically the explosion of books and printed material. Although there were people like Goethe and Alexander von Humboldt who tried to understand all knowledge comprehensively, this became manifestly impossible. We are living in another age of information overload. The crucial issue is not access to information, but rather how to filter and assess what is authoritative from what is not. Although disciplinary traditions are built upon certain enabling assumptions, they are not monolithic, but rather they're sites of debates about certain questions. Scott Jashuk argues that research universities that first emerge in Germany, along with the first disciplines, create knowledge by forming people into distinct communities. Wilhelm von Humboldt, who planned the influential University of Berlin in 1810, argued that both faculty and students must always be engaged in research, which is a process that is never complete. So it's, it's always a, an ongoing process based on the questionability of things. Disciplines were a systematic way of providing authoritative knowledge in these various domains. In a sense, it is the very admission of uncertainty and constant reassessment that allows disciplines to project epistemic authority. Or to use a phrase employed by anthropologist Marilyn Strathern, participants in a disciplinary tradition form a community of critics in which disagreement is always an opportunity for growth. A fourth perspective on what is most essential to preserve and enhance focuses on knowledge production Today, U.S. universities dominate most rankings of research institutions. They shot to the top during World War II, partly because the National Socialists in Germany began to fire all the Jews and people married to Jews in the lands underneath their control. Some, like Albert Einstein, found their way to the United States. Among all those awarded Nobel Prizes while working in the United States, one-third have been foreign-born. Near the end of World War II, the US created the NSF, the NIH, and it passed the GI Bill of Rights, which provided free education to over two million people. Henry Rosofsky, the former arts and science dean at Harvard, suggests that the persistent innovativeness of US university, universities relies on six characteristics that form a virtuous ecosystem. These six characteristics are, first, shared governance. Educational policies should be in the hands of faculty. An administrator has no business telling the chemistry department who is the best chemist to hire. On the other hand, compared to certain European models, US universities also rely on a strong executive 
who has ultimate authority over budgets and institutional priorities. The second characteristic, academic freedom. Third, selection on the basis of merit of both students and faculty members. Fourth, the liberal arts structure that recognizes the importance of culture. Five, nonprofit status. Although universities are enterprises that must be economically sustained, maximizing profit is not their end. And number six, significant human contact. Researchers teach undergraduates. They mentor graduate students. But this is never a one-way interaction. William Bowden calls it minds rubbing against minds. The interaction of researchers with young minds increases innovation. AUB has all six of these characteristics, but they must be vigilantly maintained because like most vital institutions of higher education, AUB is a contested space. The importance of human contact recalls von Humboldt's idea that both students and teachers must interact over research and Noonan's idea that the end of education is to awaken the desire to think by grasping the questionability of things. So after examining this question from multiple angles, I'm now ready to hazard an answer. What FAS and AUB must never forego as they adapt and change in the future is the open human engagement that is central to both education and research. It constitutes a kind of conversation involving students, faculty members, and others who embrace a love of thinking and are not weary of questioning what others generally hold as true. Now, I'm aware that the idea of such an open conversation is an idealization. It does not always happen at AUB or at any university, nor is access to the conversation equally guaranteed for all. The sense of exclusivity haunts the academic conversation, an issue I will return to in a moment. But as imperfect as it is, we might say that it is what we most want to nurture and enhance. Openness to the new and to each other does not imply a rejection of everything that is old, but it does imply that old ideas must be subject to the same scrutiny as new ideas. This openness requires a zone of freedom, and it is the conversation itself that actually enacts that freedom. In my view, FAS has been and must continue to be the very center of this kind of openness at AUB. I also want to suggest that the openness we value requires us to think carefully about our relation to the world beyond the campus. Should we see the campus as a fortress that protects a zone of freedom? I think this is dangerous. AUB has always interacted in many directions. It has interacted with the United States. And increasingly, it has engaged with the Arab society and region in which it is embedded. It's a place where different streams of ideas can be considered together and equally scrutinized. It's a place where distinct distinctly Arab visions of modernity have been articulated. It's also a place through which the American idea of liberal arts education, modern science, and the game of basketball have been introduced to the Arab region. Today, there is an international order in which the United States remains the most central actor. There's a tendency in the US and elsewhere to assume that the international system is ultimately positive. Those who live on the margins of this system are more aware that it is a human creation and it creates winners and losers. AUB is a place where many perspectives on this issue can be expressed, a place where some things that are difficult to question in the United States might be more openly examined. An important part of the story of AUB is the growing assertion by Arabs of their ultimate equality. The assertion was an appeal to justice, a call for the university to live up to its professed ideals. 
One example to stand for many others was the 1909 protest by Jewish and Muslim students against daily mandatory Protestant chapel services. The anti-colonial movements that asserted themselves at AUB in the 1960s and 1970s, despite their obvious excesses, were also a cry for justice. And as such, they presented an opportunity for that cry to engage with other voices and perspectives. If our academic conversation allows us to consider alternatives to the way things currently are, there are voices in Lebanon outside the campus trying to do the same. There are spaces of freedom outside the campus. In fact, our remarkable academic freedom is possible because we live in this unique Arab country. Today, there are forces coming from many directions assailing the central openness of universities. Money and political power often seem to be calling the shots. Perhaps the hope for preserving and enhancing our zone of freedom is to engage with similar spaces and impulses beyond the campus in all directions. The idea of academic freedom was conceived during the Enlightenment in parallel with the idea of a democratic society in which all citizens should, avoid, should enjoy such freedoms. By their nature, in my view, universities should not be politically neutral about such questions. Now, some of what I have said may give the impression that I'm thinking only of the humanities and social sciences. What about mathematics and the sciences? Some people have suggested that mathematics and the sciences ought to be moved to the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture. During the last seven years, I've learned more than I ever did before about the sciences, and I've gotten to know many mathematicians and scientists. I sometimes joke that before I became Dean of Arts and Sciences, having hung around more with social sciences and humanities people, and knowing how contentious and disputational they can be, I imagine that mathematicians and scientists were more rational and less prone to bitter disputes. Uh, I soon, soon learned that this was an illusion. That scientists were simply human like their counterparts in the rest of FAS. But these two groups have in common not only some of the less appealing human traits, but also some of the most ad admirable ones. I have been struck by how many scientists and mathematicians do what they do not because of a desire for wealth and status. Most of them could have made other choices. But because this is what they love doing, it's what makes their work meaningful. They have developed a love of thinking about certain questions. And for them, the willingness to question current understandings is a constant necessity. New understandings in the sciences have enormous implications for all human beings. When we think about the explorations at the subatomic level, the intergalactic level, the molecular level in biology and chemistry, the human brain, what machines can do now and what they may be able to do in the future, if we simply contemplate a one meter segment of sedimentary rocks, rock and grasp the eons of Earth history that it represents and then glance at a 3,000 meter mountain, these things cannot help but recontextualize us as human beings and our understanding of all human issues. Please let us not separate scientists and mathematicians from those who study human affairs. What we need is to find more ways for these groups to engage with each other. I also don't want to give the impression that it is only the pure and the theoretical that belongs in the arts and sciences. Our faculty members and students are engaged in all sorts of important practical questions. How to best teach a language, how to improve writing, to design an educational curriculum, to help people through emotional and mental difficulties, to curate an art exhibit, ex exhibition, to combat malaria, to monitor and improve air and water quality, to design new materials, useful and cleaner energy production, drug delivery, and environmental remediation. So many in FAS focus on the specific challenges of this city, this country, and this region, 
All of this, I think, must be embraced in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. We are situated here, and this presents an opportunity to view things from a perspective that is distinct from that of Los Angeles or London. What strikes me is that the practical problems we work on in FAS are approached from the same impulse as our more theoretical pursuits. A willingness to ad address issues freshly and to question the way things are now. Or to put it in another way, these practical pursuits are theoretically informed. Now, I want to shift gears for a moment to say something that I think is long overdue. Last fall, when the former chair of the Department of English, Jean Marie Cook, died, the department held a commemoration at which I expressed the troubling ambivalence that many of us feel about the Civil War period, a time that cannot remain buried forever, and particularly about the people who sustained the university through those times. Things were far from perfect. Threats of violence and other kinds of coercion did affect parts of AUB. Research became nearly impossible to sustain. But I have noticed that so many who were students at AUB during those years have become marvelously successful. Many of them are members of our faculty and sitting in this room today. We need to be reminded of how successful undergraduate education at AUB has been, and not only because it's still our chief source of revenue. I think it is we in FAS who must lead the way in protecting the quality of undergraduate education so that we can continue to awaken in our students the desire to think and to question. But of course, AUB cannot stand still. If the university had not reversed its ban on Arab faculty members and become a much more Arab university by the 1970s, it would simply not exist today because it was largely Arabs who remained here during the Civil War. When President John Waterbury arrived in the late 1990s, he initiated in earnest a drive to make AUB a leading research university. Peter Dorman continued this project. The trajectory has been remarkable and it is evident in publications and grants and citations and in university rankings. When the Civil War ended, Jean Marie Cook, after having served seven years as the chair of English, was almost immediately demoted because she had not produced enough publications. And many others suffered similar fates. We might say that these were the necessary birth pangs of the new AUB. But I have no doubt that on the occasion of our 150th anniversary, it is high time to acknowledge what they contributed. Arguably, the Civil War was the most serious existential threat AUB ever faced. Without their efforts, there would be no AUB. We talk a great deal about the Founding Fathers, as we should when we're marking 150 years of existence. But in a similar way, we all stand on the shoulders of those faculty and staff members who preserved this university during its darkest hours. They are also foundational. I want to conclude with a story that I once met, mentioned at a mathematics conference. In the third century BC, one of the most remarkable thinkers of any age was born and died in the city of Syracuse. His name was Archimedes. He had a brilliant theoretical mind, but he also invented many practical devices such as the screw pump, the block and tackle, and the odometer. He was called into service when the Romans attacked Syracuse in the Second Punic War. Reportedly, Archimedes directed the construction of special catapults, giant wooden claws that could capsize ships, perhaps even arrays of parabolic mirrors that could set Roman ships ablaze or at least confuse the sailors. For two full years, Syracuse withstood the Roman sea attack. Finally, the Roman general, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, launched a massive attack from the land side, and Syracuse fell. According to Plutarch, 
Archimedes was immersed in thought, contemplating a mathematical diagram when the city fell. General Marcellus apparently considered Archimedes a valuable asset. He ordered him not to be harmed and sent a soldier to summon him. The soldier found Archimedes still engrossed in his diagram, and he announced, General Marcellus wishes to see you. There was no reply. When he repeated the command, Archimedes barely looked up and replied, let me finish my demonstration. The agitated sh soldier shouted, Archimedes, General Marcellus demands to see you. There was no reply. The furious soldier lifted his sword, struck Archimedes on the head, and he fell dead. Archimedes was nobody's asset. The Romans invented the word barbarian, essentially to refer to non-Romans. Marcellus was the conqueror of Syracuse and a celebrated hero in his day. But 2,200 years later, it is Archimedes for whom a mountain range and a crater on the moon are named and whose portrait appears on the Mathematics Fields Medal. He loved thinking so much that he valued it above his own interest, indeed his own safety. I know this is an extreme example. But let me end by suggesting that what we have in common in FAS is that this impulse is not alien to us. We strive to be nobody's assets. We strive to be free. Thank you. <laughs>